So welcome everyone to our downtown charter series webinar. Thank you for joining us. I know there's still um, a number of attendees coming in, so I'm just going to give it a few seconds just so we can make sure that we're all here. All right. So as I said, uh, welcome everyone to a downtown charter series webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Alina Rietzma, the Public Legal Education Coordinator with the Center for Constitutional Studies at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. I'll be moderating today. Uh, with us, of course, is the health law scholar you came to hear, Dr. Rebecca Ogbogu. Um, before we get started, I'd like to outline a few items. Um, chat is disabled. Um, you'll not be able to send chats. And if you're familiar with Zoom, uh, Zoom webinar is a little bit different from Zoom meetings. So you're not gonna be able to come on by video or audio to ask questions. Um, instead, to ask Dr. Bogu a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, there should be a little Q&A button. Click that and you can type your question in. Other attendees won't be able to see your question. Um, Dr. Bogu is going to present for about 30, 35 minutes. Once he's finished, I'll read out the questions you've asked. I can't promise we'll get to all of them, um, but we'll get through as many as we can until the time runs out. Um, when this presentation ends, you'll see a pop-up with a link to a feedback form or survey about the webinar, um, as well as um, it gives you some options to also give us some suggestions about future webinars you might wanna see. Uh, please do take some time to fill this out. It helps us improve our webinars, um, and it's also important for our reporting and funding. So usually when there's an event at the University of Alberta, we would acknowledge the territory that we're on. Of course, in the age of webinars, uh, many of us are spread out all over, not just Canada, but the world. Um, and I'd encourage you to reflect upon the land at your respective location, wherever you are, and to think on those who came before you, who called and continue to call the land home. As I respectfully acknowledge that the center is located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Soto, Inuit, and many others, whose histories, languages, and culture continue to influence our vibrant community today. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Baka Obogu before he presents. He's an associate professor in both the Faculty of Law and of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, and was recently named a Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation Fellow. He's a good friend of the Centre and has written a blog post um, for our blog with Professor Lorian Hardcastle, which you can find on our website. And he presented on medical assistance and dying in the Charter a couple of years ago and is generously presenting on the same topic today, along with some of the changes in the law uh, in Section 7 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, Dr. Bogu specifically requested that I keep his introduction short, so I'm not going to um, go on. Um, but if you want to know more about him, um, you'll find out, find out what he's written, read some of his work. Um, I'd really encourage you to look up his bio and his CV on the University of Alberta's Faculty of Law website. He's written on numerous health law issues, and he's involved in a number of organizations and bodies related to health law and research. So I'd really encourage you um, to go look that up if, if uh, you want to learn or, or read further. So with that, um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Bogu um, to present for us. Thanks, Alina. I hope everyone can hear me. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you for uh, taking some time today to uh, join this webinar. So uh, we're going to talk today about medical assistance in dying, uh, looking specifically at uh, some of the constitutional issues that arise uh, since uh, Canada uh, decriminalized medical assistance in dying uh, and also uh, focusing specifically on some recent changes uh, to the law on medical assistance in dying in Canada. So I have a roadmap that I'm going to follow uh, and I'm going to stick to this roadmap because you know there's a lot of things to talk about uh, and anytime you give an academic uh, time to talk about stuff. They'll tell you they're going to talk for 30 to 5 minutes and before you know it uh, They take up uh, a couple of hours uh, So I, I've tried to discipline myself uh, and I'm going to try not to take 
uh, a couple of hours today because nobody has that time. But instead, uh, focus on some areas that I think are really key with respect to uh, changes in the law uh, since medical assistance in dying was decriminalized. So I'm going to be looking at uh, changes to the reasonably foreseeable natural death requirement uh, or the end of life requirement as it is uh, referred to in Quebec law. And for, for those changes, I'm going to be looking specifically at a case called uh, Trushan and uh, Attorney General of Canada. This is a very recent decision uh, that uh, introduced some changes to the law and which has uh, triggered some changes to the law that I think uh, it's important to spend some time talking about. I will also look at how the federal government has reacted to the Trushan decision. Uh, there's, a pro there's proposed legislation, uh, Bill C-7, where the government has reacted to the Trushan decision. So Trushan raises similar issues to uh, Carter. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Carter decision. Uh, and the, the primary issue is, do medical assistance in dying laws infringe constitutionally protected rights, uh, rights that are uh, protected in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Now in Carter, uh, the laws that prevent access to MAID were uh, criminal laws found in the criminal code. Those laws were challenged in Carter uh, and the court found that those laws were a violation of uh, constitutional, constitutionally protected rights. So the federal government reacted to Carter by then creating an exception for medical assistance in dying. Uh, and I'm gonna to refer to medical assistance in dying as made from now on. Uh, and in Trishon, uh, the, the challenge focuses on some requirements in the laws decriminalizing made that litigants uh, in the case found to be problematic and which were challenged as well. And then if we have time, uh, if I have time, I will uh, talk a bit about uh, another development in the law uh, and this is, this is with respect to the limits of conscientious objection as it relates to MAID. Uh, the issue here is whether uh, those who provide MAID, uh, healthcare professionals who provide MAID, can raise a conscientious objection to the procedure uh, and the extent to which they can carry that conscientious objection. What does it apply to? Um, are there any limits or restrictions to conscientious objection? For that, I'll be talking very briefly about a case called Christian Medical and Dental Society of Canada and College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. Now, these two areas uh, really engage a variety of constitutional issues uh, and several sections of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, for the first topic, for the reasonably foreseeable natural debt requirement, I will focus specifically on one of the challenged, uh, one of the uh, uh, sections of the charter that is relevant to that decision. There are several sections of the charter that are implicated, but I'll be looking only in the interest of time at uh, section seven of the charter, uh, which protects the life to the right to life, liberty, and security of the person. So that's the that's roadmap I'm gonna follow. Uh, hopefully we have time uh, to get through all of what I've planned to talk to you about today and we are able to find some time for questions as well. So I'm gonna start off by uh, just putting up this quote, uh, this excerpt from the Trushan decision, uh, where Justice uh, Badouin uh, says that, although the debate over the, cr the criminalization of medical assistance in dying has already taken place, it is evident that this final act still prompts concern in many and continues to raise questions that have been unanswered. And I, I'm putting this up just to highlight for those who may not be familiar with Canadian law on, on the topic, uh, or who may not who may be joining this webinar but not from Canada, uh, just to highlight the fact that this is a very controversial topic in Canada. And uh, even though we've had uh, developments in the law that address the controversy, it is still a question that divides opinion, uh, and it's important to keep that in mind. There are no easy answers to the questions raised by this topic and by this area. Uh, and 
very often you're going to find people uh, debating all aspects of it. So it's still very controversial. And I think the law has uh, helped to move the conversation along, but it certainly by no means has resolved uh, the controversies around this. Now, I also want to point out that in Canada, uh, it is the role of the courts to determine the constitutional validity of laws enacted by Canadian legislatures. Uh, the decriminalization was done by the Canadian Parliament, uh, and so it applies federally. Uh, but if it is challenged on constitutional grounds, then it's the courts that have it's the courts that have to determine the validity of those legislative requirements. Okay, so let's get into it. So the first thing I like to say uh, to people when I'm presenting this topic uh, is that medical assistance in dying in Canada is still illegal. Uh, and you know, some people might be shocked by that. You know, what do you mean by it's still illegal? Uh, and that's the way to look at this law. It, the Criminal Code of Canada still contains a provision that makes it illegal to provide assistance to someone else in dying. So the way to think of the laws I'm going to discuss is that they are the exception, not the rule. Uh, what that means is that when the federal government decided to decriminalize a medical assistance in dying, what they did was create exceptions from the criminal uh, prohibitions in the criminal code. That is really important uh, because it then means that strict comp compliance is required to avoid prosecution. If you're involved in made in Canada, you have to follow the law very strictly. There can be no room for mistakes because uh, if there's any mistake or misunderstanding or misinterpretation, what you then have is prosecution for a criminal offense that carries very severe consequences. So uh, you will see that this has sort of influenced how the law is implemented. Uh, in some of the cases I'm gonna to discuss today, you'll find that uh, physicians and other persons who have been charged with providing MAID uh, tend to um, hesitate or withdraw from implementing uh, or providing MAID once they have some doubt as to interpretation of the law. So I think this is really key and it's something that's really worth uh, keeping in mind. Now I'm going to go very quickly through the eligibility criteria for medical assistance in dying for those who may not be aware of what those requirements are, uh, and also for those who did not attend my first talk uh, a couple of years ago. So in Canada, to be eligible for MAID, you have to be an adult. It's not available to minors. So you have to be 18 years of age and above. Uh, you have to be eligible for publicly funded health services in Canada. Uh, and this provision is designed to avoid uh, MAID tourism, if you will. So uh, it's only eligible for the, only those who receive publicly funded healthcare services in Canada are eligible for MAID. You have to be suffering from something called a grievous and irremediable medical condition, which I'll explain in a second. And you have to be in a position to give free and informed consent. So you have to uh, still be capable. You have to have the capacity to give consent to the procedure. Grievous and irremediable medical uh, condition means that you have to have a serious and incurable illness, disease or disability, that is self-explanatory. Uh, that condition has to be in an advanced state of irreversible decline. Uh, so you, you've, it, it's, it's advanced and there's really no way to stop the, the decline caused by the uh, condition. It cannot be alleviated uh, by treatment or reversed by treatment. It has to cause you uh, physical and psychological suffering that you find intolerable and which uh, you cannot be relieved under conditions that are acceptable to you if you're the person seeking medical assistance and dying. And lastly, uh, your natural death must be reasonably foreseeable. Now, the, the legislation uh, that where made was decriminalized says that uh, the interpretation of this section does not depend on prognosis regarding the length of time you have left to live. Uh, it just simply says natural death is reasonably foreseeable. Uh, this is a deeply, deeply controversial provi provision. Uh, and I'll get to that uh, shortly. Now, in addition to, to meeting this eligibility, eligibility criteria, you also have to satisfy some safeguards. 
or some safeguards have, been, have to be implemented before you are able to receive medical assistance in dying. Uh, those safeguards include um, assessment and confirmation of eligibility. This is done by uh, medical professionals who are permitted under the legislation to provide MAID. You have to give proper informed consent. There has to be documentation and witnessing of the consent. Uh, and there has to be a confirmation of your eligibility by an independent physician or nurse practitioner who's not involved in providing or administering the procedure to you. There also has to be a reflection period of 10 days between when the eligibility requirements are satisfied and when, you, when the procedure is carried out. Now, this can be shortened if it is determined that uh, there might be reasons why um, waiting for 10 days um, will not be applicable in your case. So say, for example, if there's a chance that you might lose capacity uh, after the eligibility uh, has been determined and confirmed, then that, period, that reflection period can be shortened. Uh, there has to be a reaffirmation of your consent, an opportunity to withdraw. So you have to, they have to re-consent you just prior to when made is provided. Uh, now, uh, let's come back to this natural debt uh, requirement. What does it mean to say that natural debt is reasonably foreseeable? In Quebec law, the term used is end of life, uh, uh, which I suppose is easier to understand than saying someone's natural debt is reasonably foreseeable. Uh, I'm in my office right now. Uh, it's really hot in here. The university turned up the air conditioning. Um, and, I, 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 and I could finish this presentation um, right now. I don't think my natural debt is reasonably foreseeable, but you know, I could get outside and get hit by a vehicle uh, and die. I suppose if you think about it, really, we all have our natural debt um, reasonably foreseeable. I, I just think it's a, it's a very problematic provision, and others have found that it is quite problematic. Now, the only thing we know from the legislation is that prognosis need not be considered. But it is extremely vague and very difficult to interpret. Here's an example of why that is. There's a case called uh, AB and Canada Attorney General, Attorney General of Canada. So this was a 2017 case out of Ontario. Uh, and what happened in this case was that you have a, an 80-year-old woman who had advanced incurable osteoarthritis, met all the requirements uh, for eligibility for medical assistance in dying. She was in what the court described as uninterrupted, excruciating pain. Uh, but her physicians disagreed on whether her natural death was reasonably foreseeable. So the physicians involved in the procedure could not come to an agreement on this. And you recall that I mentioned before that when there's this kind of disagreement, you don't want to proceed uh, if you're the physician who thinks her natural death is reasonably foreseeable. Why? Because if it's a mistake, if, if you've made a mistake in your interpretation, that's criminal prosecution for you. So the provider declined to, to proceed for fear of criminal prosecution, uh, and the court was asked to interpret the provision. The court simply repeated what was in the legislation <laughs> uh, and said, deal with this on a case-by-case -case basis. All I know is that uh, death need not be imminent, and you can use prognosis, but you figure it out. So even courts can't interpret this provision in a clear fashion. So the ruling did not provide any certainty. So extremely difficult to, to interpret. And you can see then that because it's difficult to interpret, it then serves as a barrier to access. And that's what gets us to Trishan, Trishan because in Trishan, we then have a charter challenge saying, if this is acting as an access, as, a, as a, a barrier to access, then it means that even if I qualify, I'm not able to get made because of a provision in the in the made laws. And so in Trishan, what the plaintiffs in Trishan or the persons who challenged the law in Trishan argued is that this provision prevented them from getting access to MAID uh, in a way that was not constitutionally valid, in a way that interfered with their rights as guaranteed and protected by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is a human rights law. It's a federal it applies federally. It is part of the Canadian Constitution. Uh, the Canadian Constitution is the highest law of the land. Uh, and any law which is uh, in conflict or inconsistent with the, with the Constitution, including the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, is void and inapplicable to the extent of that inconsistency. Uh, the Charter applies to government action. And since legislation is uh, government action, the Charter applies to this legislation. 
And as, as I said before, it is the courts that have to interpret the charter and resolve charter disputes, which is why the uh, complainants in Trushan took this to court and said, we, we, we need you to strike down this, strike out this provision because it is not constitutionally valid for interfering with our rights. Now, the challenge three sections, the, 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 the challenge was based on three sections of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Section seven, which is which guarantees the right to life, liberty, and security of the person or personal security. Uh, I'll be talking mostly about section seven in this presentation, uh, but they also uh, cited section 15, uh, which protects equality rights and the, the right to be free from uh, discriminatory uh, laws and practices. Uh, but it, the, the case also involved uh, an application and interpretation of section one of the charter. Now this section, uh, limits or restricts protected rights and freedoms in circumstances that are demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. What does that mean in lay language? It means that rights in Canada are not absolute. Even if the court finds that your rights have been interfered with, it is possible for the courts to reason that there's, if the government does make that argument, the court can reason that there are justified reasons that the government has put forward in the interest of society, if you will, uh, for violating or infringing your rights in that particular instance. So section one is a way to sort of, that is a way for the courts to have the government explain whether there's a higher reason or higher rationale, uh, broader societal interest engaged in interfering or violating uh, someone's rights. So I'll, I'll go through the ruling in, in Trushan because I, I I think it's always good to put the conclusion uh, forward so that uh, in case you know, the power goes out, you all know where the courts landed on Trishon. So the court found that the provision that was being challenged, this natural debt uh, provision, does infringe section seven of the charter. Uh, and I, I will come back to this, but that's the conclusion that we're heading to. The court also found that the provision infringes section 15, the equality rights section, because it creates an unjustifiable distinction based on physical disability. I won't talk about that today. Um, I guess the Center for Constitutional Studies can invite me back some other time to talk about section 15, because I think the issues that are really interesting, but I won't be talking about that today. Uh, and that both infringements are not justified under section, section one of the charter. So again, there's no broader rationale for uh, allowing the infringements to be sustained uh, in, this, in this case. Uh, and so the conclusion we have uh, is that the courts want that provision gone. Uh, and what they did was allow the government some time to amend the legislation to reflect their decision. Uh, and the government has reacted by uh, putting forward proposed legislation, which is Bill C-7 that I referred to before. Okay, what are the facts of tuition? Very quickly, uh, you know, these are two individuals, uh, this case was brought by two individuals who are suffering from uh, some really uh, severe illnesses. Uh, and I'm putting this up here, uh, much of this stuff, I'm a lawyer, I don't know what most of this mean, but I'm putting this up here um, for you to see just sort of what they were going through. Uh, it's important to note that they were, the, they were both able to consent to made. Uh, and the, the bottom line is that they both meet all the criteria to qualify for made, except for this reasonably foreseeable natural debt or end of life requirement. Uh, and they ended up in a, a place where uh, that was the determination that was made in the, in, 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 with respect to them, that they don't meet this reasonably foreseeable natural debt requirement. So, so they brought this, this case. And I, I, but I also saw, I wanna put up some quotes from the decision, just to give you a sense of um, the kinds of, uh, issues that these sorts of cases engage and kinds of persons and individuals behind these cases. Uh, these are two people who are suffering from, as I said, very severe illnesses. Uh, but the, the judge took time in this case to, to sort of reflect on the value of their lives as humans and the reasons why they were requesting made. And I think this is really important. Uh, I'm gonna put, it, put up both of them. Um, the, the slides are going to be available later. I, I think you should take some time to read these uh, two statements. But also, 
if, if you can get a hold of the case, uh, it's available publicly. I think you should take some time to read the judge's comments on, on how he viewed these two individuals involved in this case. I think there's a lot of humanity in the way the judge uh, talks about these two individuals and about the reasons why they are seeking medical assistance in dying. Okay, so let's focus on section seven. The issue with section seven is, in what way does this natural death requirement infringe life, liberty, and security of the person guaranteed by section seven of the charter? So let's talk about section seven. What is up with section seven? How have the courts interpreted section seven? So here's section seven of the charter. Uh, this is a lawyer's version. Um, Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and the right not to be deprived thereof, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. This gives me a headache, and I'm a lawyer. It is simply too wordy. Uh, it's not clear exactly how a lay person is supposed to understand that. So I've created a lay version. This is the people's version. And what it means essentially is that the government can take away your life, liberty, or personal security, so long as they don't violate something called fundamental justice. That's how to interpret this section. So you have a right to life, liberty, and personal security. The government can take that away so long as they don't offend something called fundamental justice. So keep an eye on fundamental justice, really important for the purposes of this discussion. The section says everyone. Uh, so everyone has been interpreted by the courts to mean every person present in Canada, including refugees and immigrants, but it doesn't include corporations and fetuses. This is something that will only be of interest to lawyers. So I'm just going to fly through it, uh, but it gives you a sense that this is a very far-reaching uh, provision uh, that protects uh, anyone who finds themselves present in Canada. It, just, it doesn't just apply to citizens. So here's how most of us think Section 7 works. Uh, you know, give me liberty or give me death. You know, it's my rights to life, liberty, and security of the person. But that's not how it actually works. Uh, it doesn't create absolute rights. Uh, rather, what it does uh, he said, okay, so the government took my toys, you know, government took my life, liberty and security of the person. Uh, but how did they do it? Without fundamental justice, right? It, that's the key. The government can, in fact, interfere with your life, liberty, and personal security, so long as they don't offend something called fundamental justice. So these are the Section 7 toys. Uh, I'm going to talk about them again very quickly. Uh, so with respect to life, this simply means that the government cannot cause you death. The, the action cannot cause you death or increase the risk of you dying, whether directly or indirectly, unless they do this in a way that accords with fundamental justice, right? Again, keep thinking of fundamental justice. So examples of where the government might infringe this right is where they impose the death penalty uh, or force you to wait too long for medical care. Uh, and the examples in case law Courts have dealt with issues around, uh, around these sorts of examples uh, where government action increases the risk of you dying. So in, in the case we're looking at, uh, in Carter, the court said that by prohibiting medical assistance in dying, what the government was doing was increasing the risk that you take your own life before you get to a point where you have to seek help to die. So if the government says no one can assist you with dying in a, in a way that's humane, that, that forces you to commit suicide before you get to a point where you're not able to actually do it yourself. That was the reasoning in Carter. And that reasoning was maintained in Trushan. The court said the natural death requirement has some effect because in Trushan was seeing two individuals who obviously qualify for the exception the government has created. They both are autonomous individuals with full capacity to consent. They don't seem vulnerable in the eyes of the court, but they can't still qualify for the procedure because of this requirement. So the court's interpretation is that this case is not very different from Charter, from, sorry, from Carter with respect to the life requirement because it might force a person to take their own life prematurely for fear of losing the ability to do so when somebody then determines that a natural death is foreseeable. With respect to liberty, the courts have interpreted this to mean that the government cannot physically restrain you or deprive you of the autonomy to make fundamental life choices. But this again has to accord, they can do it if it accords with fundamental justice. So examples is where the government imprisons you, which is a you know, physical restraint, 
or they force medical treatment on you without your consent, uh, that will be restricting your autonomy to make your own life decisions, and that will violate the liberty requirement. In Trushon, the court said the natural day requirement prevents the applicants, uh, Mr. Trushon and Ms. Gladu, from exercising autonomy that reflects their value and dignity. Why? Because as I said before, uh, these are persons who don't seem vulnerable based on the facts before the court. They, they, they are suffering, uh, they, they, but they, they are able to consent to, to, to the procedure. And got, this requirement is stopping them from being able to exercise their consent in a way that's meaningful. So the court ruled that this also interferes with liberty requirements. And then with personal, personal security, uh, the way the courts have interpreted this is that the government action cannot, again, unless they do it with respect to fundamental justice, negatively affect your health and safety, deprive you of control over your body, or cause you phys physical or psychological suffering. Uh, and here's some examples again. I'm not going to uh, go too deep into them, but uh, courts have ruled that this is how to interpret personal security. Uh, and in, and in Trushan, the court says, well, this law was designed to stop vulnerable persons, to stop uh, vulnerable persons from taking their lives in a moment of weakness. Uh, and again, these are two people who are not vulnerable, uh, and this law interferes with their ability to control their physical integrity in a way that's meaningful to them. So the law also violates personal security. But all of this that I've just said will not matter if the government has done this in accordance with fundamental justice. So as I said before, if the government has fundamental justice on their side, then they can take away your life, liberty, and personal security. So what the hell is fundamental justice? So no one knows, really. It's no precise meaning is what you're going to find. Uh, there's been different ways that the court talks about it. I'm going to cycle through this very quickly about how the courts have talked about it over time, you know, how and why the government does things and in a legal system like ours. I tend to think of it as what the judge ate for breakfast this morning. Constitutional law scholars might disagree. Uh, but, you know, there really isn't any way to understand this uh, in a way that's meaningful to a lay person. It's something that lawyers tend to argue about. Um, and there's all kinds of arguments about what it actually means. Some of the things we know about it is that fundamental justice refers to the essential elements of our system of justice. It is something that strikes the right balance between personal and societal interests. Something that people generally accept if they are reasonable. Something that's part of our legal history and traditions. We can spend days talking about all of these things, but it still won't give us a good sense of what fundamental justice is. We also know that it must be a legal principle. It must be supported by significant societal consensus. Good luck with that. And it must be something we can identify and apply. Now, you know, I hope you're, are you, are you sort of understanding where we're going with this? Because I am not, you know, it's not getting warmer for me. So, so it's not, there's no handy list of what qualifies as fundamental justice for something so important. We really have no easy way of describing it. But we know some things about it because over time, courts have decided cases where they've said this law violates fundamental justice and here's why. And they've given some reasons uh, or some uh, cues as to when a law violates fundamental justice. So let's talk about those cues. The first thing is that the law is where government action or, or, or particular law does not fulfill its own objectives. So it has an objective, but it doesn't fulfill those objectives. It doesn't actually serve to protect the public interest that it's seeking to protect. So that law is arbitrary. If you have laid out an objective for the law, but the way you've gone about um, uh, enacting or implementing that law does not actually meet your own objectives, then it's arbitrary. Uh, now, the objective of the, of the natural debt requirement is to protect vulnerable persons in the moment of weakness. Uh, and the court ruled that this uh, requirement is not arbitrary because it does, it does fulfill that objective. It's actually stopping people who are vulnerable from taking their lives in the moment of weakness, so it's not arbitrary. Uh, the second thing we know about fundamental justice is that there's a violation of fundamental justice when government action goes too far. It takes away more than it needs to accomplish its purpose or objective. In that case, we say it is overbroad, right? And the court ruled in Trushan that the requirement is overbroad because it denies access to persons who are not vulnerable. I explained this already. Mr. Trushan and Ms. Gladue 
are not vulnerable, but the law still prevents them from getting access to MAID. So the law is too broad. It goes beyond its own objectives in this case. The third thing that we know is that uh, government action that does something that is not in the interest of the state, so that does not quite line up with its objective or does so in a manner that is too extreme is also a violation of fundamental justice. So in this case, we say the government action or law is grossly disproportionate to the objective of the law. And again, the court found uh, that this in Trishon, that was the situation. So the harm to rights suffered by Mr. Trishon and Ms. Gladu outweighs any benefit to society as expressed by the government. How does the law do that? Because it forces someone who is in tolerable pain to continue living. So it, it's a state-sanctioned continuation of life against someone's will. And that person is not weak or vulnerable. That person is somebody who's a fully autonomous individual who can make that decision. So the court said this is what Carter sought to prevent. And the same kind of issue is coming up here. And uh, uh, that's also grossly disproportionate. Uh, and in sum, the law, this requirement violates fundamental justice principles. Now, there's a, there's a fourth thing we know about fundamental justice, but that didn't apply in this case. I'm just putting it up here uh, for, so that lawyers in the room don't uh, give me a hard time. Uh, law that is vague is also one that doesn't accord with fundamental justice, but I'm not going to talk about it because it wasn't discussed in Trishon. So as I said, the court struck down this, this law, uh, this requirement, and the government reacted. So we now have some proposed amendments. They were introduced February 24, 2020. Uh, and what the government did was to repeal this reasonably foreseeable natural debt requirement. Well, sort of, but you know, I don't actually know if they repealed it or not. They, I mean, it doesn't apply in some cases and it applies in some cases. What do I mean by that? It's all about the safeguards. So the way the bill uh, does this is to say, if your natural debt is not reasonably foreseeable, new and strengthened safeguards would apply. So you don't have to show that requirement anymore, but if you don't, you're subject to some new safeguards that we just created. However, if your natural debt is reasonably foreseeable, the existing safeguards that I described before will apply. So it's like, it's like a, a tiered system where, you know, if your natural debt is not reasonably foreseeable, something, you know, you follow one, one, one pathway, and if it's foreseeable, you follow on the pathway. So this means that providers still have to interpret this provision. So uh, here's my take on, on the amendments. Um, it's like the frozen movie. Uh, and uh, this is really the highlight of this webinar. Uh, my daughter, uh, my 10 year old, graciously provided some audio, which I have to play because I'm very proud of this, uh, for you to uh, sort of get my, my take on, on these amendments. So I'm just gonna play it. Right, okay, that's it. Um, yeah, so, so, so I don't know why the government wouldn't let go of the natural debt requirement, uh, but it is still there. So if, you, if the natural debt, if, you, if you're um, somebody who still uh, meets that requirement, uh, the safeguards, the usual safeguards will apply to you, but they've been, they've been sort of revised. So the 10-day reflection period no longer applies. Uh, you still need to give uh, final consent before you receive the procedure, but it can be waived if there's a risk of loss of decision-making capacity, and they've increased the uh, sort of the scope of persons who can be independent witnesses. Uh, the new safeguards are much more stringent. That's just the gist of it. Uh, for the new safeguards, you have to have a clinician who's an expert in the medical, in the field of the, in the, in the medical condition that is implicated uh, in, in, in the procedure, uh, be, be involved in, in providing the procedure. Uh, you, they have to discuss alternative means of alleviating suffering, uh, which is not applicable if your natural debt is reasonably foreseeable. Uh, and the eligibility assessments must take a minimum of 90 days. That's a long time, uh, unless the assessments have been completed and loss of capacity is imminent. And you must provide final consent. It cannot be waived if your natural debt is not reasonably foreseeable. I'm happy to address this more in the question period, uh, but the gist of this is the new and strengthened safeguards are much more uh, onerous to um, are much more onerous and 
And uh, it seems as if what the government has done is give with one hand and take away with the other. So even though you don't need to satisfy these requirements, you then, but there's all these things that you still have to, all these hurdles you have to sort of uh, jump through to be able to receive the procedure. My sense is that this will not satisfy uh, some people and uh, you might see a challenge in the future to these provisions. Okay, so, so that's it. I, I, you know, I, I know I sort of breezed through this, but I hope you were able to sort of catch uh, the gist of it, which is these provisions uh, in, in our made law sometimes do the same thing that your original legislation was trying to uh, address uh, and which uh, then creates a situation where even though uh, made is now being decriminalized in Canada, uh, you still have persons who don't qualify uh, because of the way the, the legislation prevents them from doing so. Uh, and these challenges are gonna keep coming up uh, because people who will otherwise meet the requirements tend not to because of these provisions and the way the law is, um, the law is couched. Okay, so let me very quickly talk about conscientious objection provision. Uh, so this case, uh, Christian uh, Medical and Dental uh, case, concerns a policy by the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, which requires physicians to provide something called an effective referral to another provider if they object to provide a MAID. So you don't have to provide MAID if you object to it. Uh, and this is made very clear in the, in the federal law, decriminalizing MAID. You don't have to, but the CPSO says you should provide or you must provide effective referral to another provider. What does effective referral mean? It means a referral made in good faith to a non-objecting, available, and accessible physician, nurse practitioner, or agency that can um, help the client uh, get placed with another provider. So, so this case was about physicians objecting to being, to having anything at all to do with MAID. So the argument that they make is, if I object to the procedure, I object to everything about it. I shouldn't be able to provide effective referral. And the court rejected that argument. The court said, well, we have to balance your rights as a, as a provider with uh, the interest of the patient. Uh, the court agreed that this provision interferes with their freedom of religion. That was the, the section of the charter that was implicated, the freedom of religion and conscience of the physicians. But uh, in the interest of the patient, uh, the court said, there has to be some compromise, some balance. Uh, and the best to strike that balance uh, is to allow you to object, but require you as the CPSO has done to provide an effective referral. The court ruled that the CPSO policy was a reasonable limit. So they applied section one, if you recall, remember section one, it's a reasonable limit on someone's freedoms or rights in this context because it represents a compromise between the patient's interests and the physician's charter protected religious freedom. So that's all I have uh, in terms of uh, the, the presentation and I will now take your questions. We have about 15 minutes to go, so we have uh, quite a bit of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Obogu. Um, I think you did a wonderful job really breezing through that and breezing through section seven. Um, which can be quite complicated. Um, just before I get to asking some of the questions, one thing I forgot to mention is that we are recording um, this presentation. So if you want to review it later, or you have friends who are interested but couldn't make it, it will be available on the website um, shortly, um, probably later this week. So let's get to some of the questions. Um, so the first question that we have is, can you please comment on legal implications of including psychiatric illnesses as eligible medical conditions? Ooh, that's a, <laughs> that's a big one. So um, persons who have mental illness as the sole underlying condition that they're relying on to seek MAID are excluded from uh, being able to access MAID. So the uh, original legislation that decriminalized MAID uh, did not in made it very clear that persons who um, were mental illness is still an underlying condition, you wouldn't qualify for MAID. The government did commit to studying this issue uh, to 
get some advice from experts uh, on how to deal with that issue. They also committed to studying uh, whether made should be made available to minors uh, who are capable of consenting to it, uh, and also whether persons can request made by an advanced directive. So if they can request it ahead of uh, when they actually are in a state, uh, in a situation where um, they may not qualify. So, so for example, if they lost autonomy to consent, or lost the capacity to consent, sorry. Uh, now, with respect to that provision, it's, the, the government uh, um, asked the Council of Canadian Academies uh, to, to study the issue. Uh, there was a panel uh, that studied the issue of whether mental illness. So they studied these three areas that I described, including whether mental illness as a sole online condition uh, is one of the areas that the government should think about revising the laws to allow persons with mental illness as a sole online, online condition to qualify. Uh, I, I can tell you that the issue remains controversial. Um, and the Bill C-7 makes it very clear that persons with mental illness as a sole online, online condition still do not qualify. I think it's an issue that's going to, you know, remain really controversial. My, my personal view of it is that um, if you meet the criteria uh, for qualification that applies to persons that have a, sort of a physical condition, you should be able to access the procedure. But I'm not an expert in how you evaluate this in psychiatric terms. Um, and I know it's very controversial even among uh, people who are knowledgeable as to when uh, a person can be deemed to be in a situation uh, where they're in an advanced state of irreversible decline. Uh, so when you're looking at the criteria and applying it to mental illness, there's a lot of debate about, about, uh, about that. And I think that's why the federal government has decided that for now, that's not something that they're gonna open up still. So you mentioned directive, so perhaps this is a good question to move to. Um, is in your opinion, why is there not acknowledgement of advanced directives as a legal instrument as being appropriate for specifying requests for made in absence of the capacity to do so? Example, in cases of sudden loss of capacity due to consent due to traumatic brain injury, coma, or in potential future developments of dementia. This is in opposition to the intent of advanced directives to restrict decisions over your care in absence of your ability to inform it. Not allowing advanced requests of made hands the decision over to others in the absence of recognition and advanced directives. So yeah, I think that's a great question. I, uh, my, my personal view of it, uh, in fact, my professional view of it is that I, I don't really understand why someone couldn't by advanced directive request made. The way I like to explain it is that I, given the nature of the public debate around medical assistance and dying and given the you know, level of controversy that it creates, I think the government's approach to this area has been baby steps, if you will. I think when the uh, made laws were first uh, enacted. I think the government just wanted to start out with areas that were, I suppose, the least controversial, if you will, uh, and then sort of fill their way into these other areas that they deem to be a lot more controversial. I, I don't think advanced directives, to my mind, are that controversial. It seems to me that if you're able to use advanced directives in other areas of medical care, uh, that can have implications as serious for you as a person as medical assistance in dying. I see no reason why you couldn't use advanced directives in the context of medical assistance in dying. But it's one of those areas that the government said, you know what, we're not gonna touch this right now, baby steps, we're gonna allow, we're gonna ask the experts to study it and advise us on it. Uh, and I, I think um, if we're gonna see any change with respect to uh, broadening the law, uh, in, in any of those three areas, I suspect advanced directives might be one of the first uh, to make it in there. Uh, Bill C-7 contemplates uh, this in some way by, by saying you don't need to give, I suppose you don't need to give final consent if your natural death is not reasonab is, uh, uh, reasonably foreseeable. But I think we need you know, clar clarity on this, and I think it's one of all the areas I'd like to see uh, the law change. Thank you. So the next question that I have, um, it says, I'm a bit confused here. If people have the right to decide about their life and death and their judgment capacity is not impaired, why doesn't the government provide them with a kit with instructions that they can use themselves to put an end to their lives once they have met all the uh, eligibility criteria? Uh, 
why should it be the responsibility of a physician to do that? As far as I know, MEDA is not a treatment or health care. Right. Um, that's a two-parter right there. So I'll address it first. So uh, I should have explained this earlier. Uh, MAID is available in two ways in Canada. Uh, one way is clinician assisted. So that's the, the method that I've described mostly in my talk, which is you're going to, um, you're having a, a, a clinician, a, a physician or nurse practitioner uh, administering the procedure. But MAID is also uh, available uh, as a sort of self-administered. So you, so for example, get a prescription from a physician and you're able to you know, administer it to yourself at home. So those two options, uh, are, uh, methods are available in Canada. Uh, and it, you know, the government is not really providing you with a kit, but they've provided, uh, they've enacted legislation that makes it possible for you to get a prescription from your physician or nurse practitioner if you meet the eligibility requirements uh, and for you to take that prescription and get it filled and then administer, uh, self-administer made at home. Um, so, so I think that sort of addresses that question. Uh, what's the second part of the question again? The, the last sentence? I think it was that um, they understood that made wasn't health care per se. Right. Uh, no, I don't know if I'll agree with that. I, I think um, the exception that is created to the criminal law, uh, what that exception does is make it very clear that medical assistance in dying is a medical procedure and uh, it's part of healthcare. Uh, and the courts have been very clear on this, that uh, this is a healthcare procedure and it's a health service. Uh, and uh, that's why you know, physicians are being told, if you can provide a health service, then you have to provide an effective referral. Uh, and, and that applies, that is some kind of policy that applies to how we see physicians deal with patients. You know, you, if you go to your physician for treatment and they can't provide that treatment, they have to refer you. Uh, and there's no reason why not to do the same in the context of MAID, uh, even though they uh, hold a conscientious objection. Uh, and the reason for that is that courts tend to view uh, MAID as a healthcare service. And I agree with that. Uh, you'll see from the language in, in the Christian medical case that, that the court is talking about the patient's interests, uh, which suggests to me that, you know, you use the term patient when you're talking about healthcare, which suggests to me that this is uh, a health service. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, so the next question I have, um, it's a comment, but I think there's, there's a question in there. It says, I'm confused how the new safeguards respect the autonomy of the person, especially when they meet the basic requirements. I'm confused too. Uh, as I, I, know I, I think I made it clear when I was describing the safeguards that I think we're going to, we're going to, we're probably going to have to come back to this, um, is implicated. If somebody is, uh, is not able to access the procedure because the safeguards serve as a barrier. Uh, now, I, if I go back to safeguards, some of them, you know, I think, you know, can be met. I think it'll be e relatively easy to find a clinician who's an expert in medical condition. Um, I, I think it's a little bit paternalistic to ask, you know, to tell someone about alternative means of alleviating suffering. I see they wouldn't know that if they're in that kind of situation. I find that to be a paternalistic safeguard, but, you know, I don't think it's going to be a barrier. Um, the two things I see as barriers will be eligibility assessments that have to take a minimum of 90 days. I know there's an exception to that, but you know, that, that seems pretty uh, stringent. I don't know how the government decided on 90 days is um, what the, and why not 60 days? Why not 30 days? You know, it's, it's just not clear to me how they arrived at 90. Uh, and that final consent must be provided before the administration of MAID. Now, this is a problematic provision because um, under the existing uh, legislation uh, or the existing exception um, that creates access to MAID, uh, many of the situations where individuals are not able to access MAID, it, it, the reason for that is that they lose the capacity to consent before the procedures administered. So they've been deemed eligible, they've consented, they lose capacity, and then they are not able to receive MAID. That actually accounts for uh, a significant number of persons who are not able to successfully obtain MAID 
even though they've been deemed eligible and they've consented. So I, I think those might be two provisions that bring us back to where we started from, which is this question of, can the government really craft a law that respects rights and freedoms uh, in a way that doesn't keep take, getting persons uh, who would otherwise qualify to go to court to try and enforce their rights? So this next question, I think, more concerns the status of, of Bill C-7. It asked if um, it become law. They said that they thought I heard discussion about further revisions. Right. It's, it's been through uh, first reading in Parliament. Uh, it has to go through second and third reading. So there's still a, a number of uh, steps it has to go through before it becomes law. Uh, and uh, I, I, I suspect it's not going to make it onto the legislative agenda anytime soon, in part because of uh, COVID and the fact that well, the country is dealing with a pandemic. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know when exactly it's going to become law, but I, I'm, I think, yes, uh, in the sort of normal process of debating legislation, you're going to see changes introduced to it. Um, I, I suspect that's going to be the case here because I think there's, there's some still problematic uh, provisions in the amendments in the proposed amendments, and I hope that um, MPs do uh, debate these these provisions and try to uh, arrive at at provisions that will not raise constitutional issues. Now, of course, uh, Canadians can participate in that by always letting those who represent them know uh, how the what how they feel about legislation. Because so I think it's important to have a really good debate about its implications uh, for persons who might be seeking the procedure. Uh, but yes, it's only been through first reading, uh, and there's still a long ways to go, I think, before it becomes law. So the next question concerns children. It says, what are your thoughts on reforming MAID legislation further to allow for parents to access MAID for their children who do not fit within the mature minor rule, or who may never be competent enough to consent to MAID? So I was on the, on the, on the, I was on the CCA panel that looked at mature minors. Um, uh, and I can, you know, I mean, that was controversial in and of itself, whether or not uh, mature minors can access MAID. I think it's, it's going to be a long time before we get to the point where uh, minors who are not capable are able to access the procedure. I can tell you my personal views on this, um, but my personal views by no means represent how the law is going to develop in this area. M my personal view of it is that if somebody meets the criteria for you know, the grievous and irremediable medical condition, it's really difficult for me to accept that they should keep living in pain. Um, it is a means to alleviate or is they alleviate or end their suffering. Uh, but that my views on this are pretty, I suppose, extreme to one end. Uh, the main issue that is implicated here is consent. But we allow parents to and you know, we will argue to the death for the parental privilege or right to uh, make decisions on behalf of their children, provided they're making those decisions in the best interest of the children. So I don't see why this should be any different. I think if it is deemed to be in the best interest of a child not to keep them uh, in a condition where they, they, they keep suffering, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be the same. But I hold the view that made even though it raises these deep concerns and societal uh, issues that we debate about, and there's no social consensus on it, I hold the view that uh, it, is, it is in many ways similar to many healthcare situations where we make these kinds of decisions. They're not easy decisions anyway, uh, and I don't know why we should make a difference. Uh, it should make a difference in this case. Thank you. Um, so we're getting close to time. I'll put one more question. I'm sorry we're not going to get to everyone's. Um, this person notes this is more of a theoretical question, but they're asking, what if there is no available non-objecting physician out there? Is the patient forced to accept that no one is able to help them? Or is there a requirement for the physician to provide MAID regardless in that instance? No, I don't think that would ever be the case. Um, but I also don't think the, the way you imagined it is possible. I, I think. Um, it's difficult to answer a question that I know will not represent the reality uh, that we were likely to see. I think there will always be somebody who's available and most provinces have organized practice around this uh, to 
identify and refer patients to persons who are able to provide the procedure. That's not to say that this is, that's also not controversial. I mean, it's deeply controversial. I could spend an entire, uh, I could spend another hour talking about the different ways that provinces have implemented this and why that's controversial. But I think there will always be a non-objecting uh, physician to provide it. And most provinces have made sure of that. But there's also an association called the Canadian Association of Maid Assessors and Providers uh, who, who um, develop policy and serve as a reference point for finding uh, persons who are able to provide the procedure. But I still think there's access barriers uh, simply because, you know, if, I, if I'm somebody who lives in Alberta, say I'm in a, um, a continuing care facility and, uh, you know, I, I'm not able to, um, I can't be moved to um, anywhere else and there's no physician who's willing to provide it around me. Um, that, that's a massive issue. And we've seen cases where patients have been moved uh, at great distress just because there's no provider near them uh, and they had to move somewhere where uh, they can find a provider to help them with the procedure. So I, I think ideally what I'd like to see is that the access barriers are addressed. One of the things that usually happens with uh, cases like this, when, when the law resolves the problem, when the law resolves the constitutional issue, uh, even though it's no longer illegal to receive the procedure, we see access barriers because the government has not done enough to ease those access barriers. They haven't actually so sort of put some thought into how they're going to make it available. We've seen that in the context of abortion, for example, uh, and I think we're seeing similar things in the context of MAID, uh, even though it may not be as severe. Well, unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. Um, but I'd like to thank Dr. Okbogu very much for spending this hour with us. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your knowledge and your passion with us. Um, I'd also like to thank the other Centre for Constitutional Staff as well, Pat Purdy, um, our Executive Director, and Martin Gott, Health Administrator, who also assisted with some of the preparations and advertising for this webinar. Um, and lastly, but certainly not least, um, I'd like to thank all of you who attended today. Um, we couldn't run these events without you. Um, and I really hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I did. So thank you, Dr. Bogu. Thank you everyone for being here today. And uh, please don't forget to fill out those feedback forms um, when the presentation ends. Um, it's really helpful for us. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone.